All right, my phone's my gavel for today, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. And we will go ahead and start with introductions, starting with Mr. Croft and going around the table and then into the audience. Eric Croft. Amy Gondoski. Felix Rivera. Forrest Dunbar. Dick Rainey. Doug Warren. Nancy Burke. Amber Jackson. Tom Graham. Zach Burgess. Kim Sides. Kevin Kelly. Fiona Johnson. Elizabeth Schultz. Lisa Satterby. Okay. Asha Hunch, Wesley Dean, Beth Wilson, Morning Castle, Karma Reed, Colleen Bifford, DJ Alvin, Christopher Perez, Laurie Irwin, Larry Kelly, Rebecca Walsh, Jim Thompson, Andrew Stalin, Lily Dupreen, Derek Black. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, so before I move on to our business items. Online. Just, oh, thank you. On the phone, we have uh, Senator Tom Baggage and my staffer Sydney Kaufman. Thank you, Senator. Um, so, a uh, quick note on public comment: um, anyone in the audience can comment on any item on the agenda as we are discussing it. Uh, if you have a general comment, please save that for the audience participation part at the end. And all comments are limited to two minutes. Um, so moving on to committee discussion. Um, so this is the portion of the agenda where the committee can bring up any ideas, uh, any concerns from constituents, just so we have it on the record and, to, and can discuss it with the agencies in the room. So I'll open it up to the floor to my colleagues if they have anything to discuss. Otherwise, I do have something. Felix like Suzanne should be on our way to Haynes for an AML meeting. Okay. Thank you. And uh, for the record, Mr. Weddleton has joined us. Uh, and uh, just uh, to note, um, our ex officio members are more than uh, welcome to discuss if you have anything. Mr. Lankin. Yep. All right. So I did want to um, open up a discussion. So uh, um, since becoming the chair of this committee, um, I have been approached on a regular basis by business and civic leaders who are particularly uh, interested in getting engaged in this topic. Um, they are seeing it more uh, affecting their businesses and they want to help in whatever fashion. But the uh, engagement I've got is basically tell us what to do because we aren't the service providers we aren't the ones who know what levers to pull you tell us what to do and we can see how the we can engage the community to make things happen so uh, I would love to start and initiate this conversation um, with the business uh, with the agencies that we have in the room you know, what are the needs that your agencies are seeing right now and that you don't have the resources for that the community uh, can maybe come together and help with? Um, again, this is the start of a conversation that I would love to have because, again, I have folks coming to me all the time saying, how can we help? And, um, you know, right now I'm not able to give them too much. Um, so if anyone wants to chime in from the audience, I would love to hear your thoughts. It's uh, well, I would say, you know, one thing that, that we're trying to do more of, too, is to bring people down to campus to Brother Francis Shelter and to Beads Cafe jointly and have them tour the two facilities, understand the services that we provide on campus and what's available and what we can do and what we can't do because I think a lot of times there's... Um, you know, misconceptions about the services that are available or what's not available. Um, so I would open it up that any committee, me any community member that comes to you, please send them to me. I would be happy to coordinate a tour for them. We can do it as a group. I know we had, you know, members of the assembly come down. I think that was wonderful. Um, I think that's a good first step in just understanding kind of what some of the services are and what they currently look like. You know, um, we always need it means we always need people to come in and volunteer, whether it's to help prep a meal, serve a meal. Um, volunteer in any capacity um, and then we'll be heading into winter so we'll need food we'll need socks we'll need all those types of items as well so um, I think just getting people to connect with the agencies to see the agencies firsthand is a great first step 
Thank you, Miss Sauter. Um, does anyone else in the audience have any any thoughts that they'd like to add to that discussion? Hi, this is Sydney from Senator Begich's office. I'm so sorry that we couldn't be there in person, um, and the senator actually just had to run out to go uh, talk to the ethics committee about a request we had. But he, as he was leaving the office, suggested that maybe there might be interest in developing an overarching capital campaign uh, within the larger Anchorage community to help support some of these agencies that are trying to do this work to reduce homelessness. Um, so I don't know if that's something that's already in progress or something that any of you have considered, but I'll just put that out there. Thank you. All right. Now is your chance to uh, say your piece. Uh, if any agencies out there. Okay. So then we're going to go ahead and... Uh, May I just... You know, sure. I didn't introduce myself yes. earlier. I'm Dave Kuyper. Um, I, I um, participated in the Anchorage Coalition to End Homelessness Board meeting this past week. And one of the things that I heard at the, from uh, the board members there was that there is a, a desperate need for skilled outreach workers um, in Anchorage who um, who understand and can work with folks who may be struggling, um, struggling with uh, mental health issues, uh, help them move from their situation to treatment. But there's a, there's a decreasing amount of funding uh, that, that our city is experiencing. And so if if there is a group of folks that thinks they might be able to contribute to funding for outreach workers, I think that would be a tremendous help. Thank you. <coughs> yes, Mr. Train. Since he brought that up, as we get into this budget decision, there's going to be a significant decrease amount of available money. And we've got to keep that in mind because sometimes we want to throw money at this problem, and there's no money to throw at it. We've got to figure out other ways to do it. Thank you. It's coming. So just uh, so everyone's aware what Mr. Traney is referring to, um, we are expected to have a $20 million deficit in our budget for this next budget cycle, which is going to affect every department and including uh, going to affect what, uh, if any, money that we can dedicate to projects specific to homelessness, um, which the Assembly was able to do two years ago. Um, but hasn't been able to do since. Um, okay, so seeing no further discussion, we'll go ahead and move on to the mayor's report. Ms. Burke. Thank you. Um, I think I would, I would like to maybe just review for the committee that the um, overarching plan to address homelessness in Anchorage has a, a really strong core that is represented by the Anchorage Coalition to End Homelessness, which is all of the service providers, many of the service providers who work in the homeless arena and are also um, grantees of the federal funds that come in. And the federal funds are the primary um, resource that's used to fund services for homelessness in Anchorage. Um, there are also state funds through Alaska Housing Finance Corporation and some through the State Division of Behavioral Health. Um, but this this backbone also includes United Way and the Mayor's Office, and we have we have come together jointly and embraced the plan to end homelessness, including some of the priorities that the Mayor's promoting for a particular population that um, is struggling on the streets, the adults who are homeless. And um, just, just by way of background, that those those groups are collaborating, and um, Dave Kuyper just gave an update of a, like a recent topic that's come up with some changes in how the funding's coming into Anchorage um, through two, diff two different programs made changes at the same time, which represents <coughs> over $500,000 that was previously targeted toward mental health outreach on the street and is now um, gone in, with fairly short notice about two, three months notice on, on that change. So, you know, we, I think the, the groups that are represented in that, in that core planning group are amazing at making resources match and, um, you know, changing as we go. 
and I think it's a good idea maybe for that backbone committee to keep this this committee updated on how it's going for them to recon reconstitute those services so that we don't have increases in individuals with um, pretty disabling conditions on the street this winter. Um, so that group is moving forward with our collective impact model. We're going to look at the data that's come out of this, this planning. I think we've, we've almost reached a point where we have all of the partners um, in, in agreement and ready to sign off on those joint outcomes for the community so that we can, we can do a better job with what we already have existing in the system and, um, and then know where our gaps are with, with much more certainty based on data. Um, coming back to us, so that'll, that'll be a great discussion today. Um, but really, I think that group can help <coughs> facilitate conversations. Um, if there are business members, um, you know, the coalition has hired a new director. United Way is really engaged in the work, and then of course, um, you know, we're all working together from the municipality side. And I think it, it's it's a great idea to um, bring people together to have the conversation as we as we reallocated what's existing in the community, what do we need in, in addition to that? Um, that would be a great conversation. Um, to help understand more of what the needs are, we're going to conduct another summer count for homelessness. And uh, because of our desire to have an accurate count, um, we're, we're not going to use the point in time count methodology that we've used for the winter count. Rather, instead, the um, police are going to implement all of the, both of the CAP teams that um, are under Lieutenant Carson for a week-long survey of the community using, um, using the police. We think this will give us a better opportunity to canvas um, more thoroughly. They'll be um, quicker than our, our volunteers were when we, when we sort of train people up and, and send them out and we'll get a better count because the police really know where camps are and they've been doing this work for a long time. We will also make sure to include regions where we're hearing reports of more camps, which include Eagle River, Chugiak, Girdwood, um, so looking to the uh, outer boundaries of the, the bowl as well. That count will take place next week, the week of the um, 21st. Twenty-first through twenty-fifth, and uh, the way it will work is the police will survey Tuesday to Friday. The social service providers, um, Beans Cafe, um, Anchorage Gospel Rescue Mission, and Brother Francis Shelter will help us with a count of persons staying in the shelter. And by running it across a week, that'll give us an interesting look as to who was in shelter on Monday. We're doing the canvas of camps. Who's in shelter on Friday? It'll help us understand um, some movement if there is any. Uh, then once we have that number, what we did last year with our out summer outreach number was use that number for the first, first time in the community to plan for how many people we think might show up requesting shelter in the winter. And this helps <coughs> us with some of the impacts um, that are happening in neighborhoods where people don't have anywhere to go. When someone presents for shelter, we want to be able to send, refer them to a location so they're <coughs> not continuing to try to camp or stay on um, properties that are public or private. So um, after our count next week, we'll be able to, I'm, I'm planning to have a report for the committee by the September meeting. Um, last year it took us a little bit longer to make sure that we weren't duplicating in our count, so I'll, I'll give an update on that. But the plan is to have that number for September because our overflow shelter season begins October 1. And so this will help us get a better view. Once we have a couple of years of data around how many people are in, in the bowl in the summer, that helps us with our planning for ensuring that we have adequate shelter spaces, but then ultimately housing for people. Um, on the note of housing, we'll have an update. And actually, sorry, uh, if I could interrupt, I have a couple of questions okay. from members. Uh, Mr. Trainee. You said $500,000 that we've had is gone now. Is that coming? Is that a loss of state or federal? A combined. $500,000. Okay. Who is paying and what's the total dollar amount? Do you guys are police for to this time and at this time of counts you're talking about? What's the cost factor? Is that being paid for by the police department's funds? Or out of the mayor's office. 
It's it's the regular police department. Do you know what the factor is going to be the cost? Uh, in terms of overtime, or yeah. it's regular work hours. It's their regular. I just want something from your department that tells me what the cost is going to be for diverting our police officers to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Mr. Croft. Let's say 200 or 500. John and I. Five. Five. We started. Um, and having a more accurate count, uh, any anything you can do to refine that number helps, but it also makes it harder to compare apples and apples, right? I mean, from your, when we change our methodologies, then there's always an asterisk on, well, this count was done differently. And so, help with, without disturbing you doing your job to get a good number, it does make our side of kind of oversight job a little harder when we really can't tell now what the difference was. So is there any way to accomplish your goal and still have us have a relatively comparable no number? What aspect of that can I compare to the year before or five years before? I think there's, um, there's two answers. Um, the first one is the point in time count is is a flawed methodology. It's, it, it just is, a one night count, and, and depending on what time of day you do it. Last year we did the point in time count in the morning, uh, and we, we, we encountered a, a large number of camps that were vacant. Um, so, you know, even though that's been our data point, it is, it's a limited data point. Have you changed the times that you did? The, you did a point in time day, but was it morning sometimes and afternoon sometimes? We haven't done the summer count, so we're really still trying to figure out what is the best. The, the best winter one was it. the one that was required by federal. The winter one is required, and we won't change methodology on that one. We'll stay at 4 a.m. the last Wednesday of January, canvassing the community. We'll use the gridded areas. Um, that's the that's the me that methodology is pretty set, and we, we will use that. You're keeping the old one because it's a federal requirement. Yes. Not because you think it gives you the best number. It has been done for several years, so it's, you know, we, um, we like to compare apples to apples. However, the second point that I wanted to make is that having an active database in the community that will record um, persons we encounter and the camp notifications are going into that database as well, that number is the number as soon as we feel like we've had enough time and grade to produce quality data from that database, that number will be the solid um, database and then we can decide if we want to do other snapshots or other things to, um, you know, verify or give us another view of it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Croft. Mr. Weddleton. That was, I just wanted to clarify that dollar amount. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Weddleton. Go ahead, Ms. Burke. Uh, so... Moving on to housing, we will begin looking at housing opportunities. Um, there's an update a little bit later on our um, the work we've been doing <coughs> around one opportunity, but as we move forward, we'll be looking at the um, where housing is, where uh, we can produce more housing for people, and the big question, which um, I don't believe anyone in the room really has the answer to yet, is how will we how will we help with the um, resources to get people to housing. We, we have a bottleneck. We know that there's a bottleneck. And so those are some of the questions that we'll be taking up over the course of the next year to focus on housing as the solution. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Any further questions from the committee? Okay. Seeing none. Any questions from the audience on the mayor's report? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, data and uh, before we begin this presentation I just had a couple of words um, I really want to thank the coalition um, United Way and uh, the city for really coming together and um, working diligently uh, to figure out what data points are the ones that we need to track I know uh, Mr. Croft and I and uh, Mr. Dunbar we've all attended uh, meeting specific to uh, this issue because it is so important that we all come to an agreement on the data points we want to use to track how 
uh, what our efficacy is and if we are actually moving the needle forward. Um, and having an agreement will help to determine what, lev what levels, levers to pull and what tactics to use. And it really will help to develop, I think, a frame so I can go to the community and be your champion for the different tactics that we're going to be using. Um, so with that, I want to uh, open it to our data conversation. So the, um, there was a subcommittee. Um, there was a subcommittee that met last week, and there is a couple of different documents in your um, in your binder, of really, that we've been working through this question of how do you get to the point where you can have one dashboard that tells you how are all of these points of our system working together and, uh, you know, in, and unite the data that comes from many different places. Some people are providing services through the homeless, it, the homeless service system, some are mental health service system, some are substance abuse system. And so having a database that helps us, a, a data dashboard that helps us unite that information and gives us a, a sense of how we're doing as a community. So there were, there were two documents available. One was that bigger, kind of what I call the placement um, size document that we've reviewed in the past. I've shrunk it down, and um, I think by popular demand made it a little smaller. Um, after review of the subcommittee last week, having the conversation around these particular data points, um, I think that we have agreement between our assembly partners, the mayor's office, the Homeless Coalition and United Way, that this is our, this will be our data dashboard. Now, a word of caution about it is some of the data in here is readily available and some of it I have um, indicated we need um, data development agenda items because the data doesn't live in one place. We have to be collecting it from um, different places around the community and we'd have to have a lot of buy-in from our service providers and others. But that's the work I think that our subcommittee through the Homeless Coalition, the United Way, and our office is, is prepared to do so that we can have a dashboard that is, lives on a website that any community member can go to at any time and say, how, how are we doing? How do we compare to other communities? Um, where do I get the data? Um, so this smaller um, spreadsheet is the one that we will take forward from here. And um, I just want to ask maybe the committee or the chair, is there um, would people like me to walk through this, to explain it? There might be some members that this is a little newer to, or um, would you like me to move to the other summary? Um, I would say if we can do a quick, because we have seen this several times, so if you can do a quick summary of this, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. If anybody else wants to give it, I'm sure you could by now. <laughs> Um, so the, the way that we've broken our work into really, honestly, is um, somewhat cryptid from other communities. Um, Seattle has a really great uh, website called All Home that you might visit, which um, defines homelessness as brief, rare, and um, brief, rare, and not, not recurring. Not recurring. <laughs> Um, which, which boils it down into ways that are easy for um, the general community to understand. So in order to look at how, um, how homelessness might be brief, then we would be looking at how long do we believe that people are homeless in the community before we can get them connected to the resources that will help them find housing. So this section, phase one, is days from street contact to case management. And so we've gone through the different places where we know we're having contact with people. Um, for instance, the first line is the vulnerability index is what the coalition is uh, providing to homeless members as an assessment. We know that data is located in HMIS we can produce that data for the committee and roll it up into one um, website. Campsites, we know that the police are required by ordinance to go out and to um, address campsites that have been noticed, and so that data lives in a system, um, and we can, we can identify that information and report that. The next area is Outreach services, um, how are things going in downtown and midtown? We get a lot of calls and concerns about homelessness and the impacts that are happening in businesses and neighborhoods. 
This is an area where I would say we need to um, have a data development item. Maybe this would be best served by having a survey of those community members. Maybe this could be some data that's already been collected by security companies or the parking authority or others. This is a data development item. We, we need to take a look at this. Looking at shelters, this data is available in HMIS. We know whether or not um, shelters reached capacity or not because it's recorded every day in HMIS. Um, the Anchorage Safety Center, I went ahead and produced this. Um, we have this document. We get this information from the fire department through the health department. Um, so we know how the safety center is performing and that has some overlap with homelessness, not 100% overlap, but some probably significant overlap with homelessness and um, then a general community survey. So some of these are data development items and some of them are ready to be reported up into a dashboard. Any questions about that? Yes, Mr. Croft. I know you want to uh, keep moving and you guys were doing work, I uh, apologize for being out of uh, country well, last week and we had your meeting. The, the, the phase says days from street contact to case management. The indicator says number of homes. Later when we talk about length of phase three, months of length of stay in permanent housing, the indicator is actually length of time in stable housing. But are we using the number of homeless as a substitute for the days from street contact to Cape? What I expected to see the indicator to be is the number of days from street contact to case management, not the number that are sitting in various temporary accommodations. Each of those seem to be point in, well, whatever, maybe point in time, but numbers of people in various places. Shelter overflow number, ASC stays. No, um, I, you are correct, I dropped it. Uh, it should be length of stay in shelter is what the indicator is. And um, and then uh, phase two doesn't have an indicator uh, heading, but maybe, but it does seem to some of those. Well, it's hard to tell whether those. I can see why you'd want to go first contact to case management. We are providing services, even though that still seems to me to be somewhat of an input rather than an output. It's what you're doing rather than a result we got. But, but that, that's okay if, if that makes sense for you because the second one is case management to housing, which is really a deal. You've got them in housing. And then, and we can tell something from that. So by adding the two numbers, we can tell something from it. And if, it, and if the middle number gives you some value, then that's fine. But, and then we've got the other of how long did they stay in housing. And, and those two should give us an idea of, of success. My continual worry, and you and I have talked about it some, is I don't know whether to take the number of people in shelters as a, a success number, a failure number, or a what's happening to you number. That is, I genuinely don't know what it is. Is it what has happened and you're responding to it? Is it success? Because certainly temporary housing is not the success we want. And it creates all kinds of community issues we know. So. In some ways of looking at it, it's a failure number. The people we have in temporary, as opposed to, mm -hmm. uh, and and so, I continue to to puzzle with what that tells us about. But time to housing and stay once you get there do tell me things that I think um, have lasting value. Absolutely, and so um, those are the art overarching. Yeah. That's another thing. Is all of this data should be feeding up into that overarching just as a snapshot how long does it take someone to get from the street to housing in our community and we can compare that then to how long does it take in Seattle how long does it take in Denver um, so some of those are not articulated in these lower ones as well as they need to be I'll make these edits um, I do want to point to in phase two we started to take a look at the level of need. As we talked about, some people have lower needs, some people have higher needs. And the length of time we could expect is different. 
and we do want to make sure that we're making the right referral. Like, we don't want people with low needs seeing someone, a case management person who specializes in high need services. That's not a good use of our resources. So in some ways, some people we want actually to kind of skip this, this um, connection to services. We want them just to go to housing because they can probably do it re relatively um, without assistance. So we start breaking it into these need areas, and then what I've added is length of stay is what we need to be looking at. Length of stay for people who are in like a, no, a low need kind of category, length of stay for people who are in a mid-range and then high. And one, one cautionary note from other communities, we don't want to do um, what I've heard other communities talk about as, as a banding. Like we don't want to say, oh, you're a high need person, so you're going to have to just wait. If a, if a person is, is sort of um, assessed as high needs but wants to, uh, wants to move quicker or move into another kind of a setting, we do need to let them try and make sure that we give support and then um, you know, help them move along regardless of where we're banding them. They, they, they talk about banding your system. Don't hamstring yourself by categorizing people and then leaving it there. Um, so, so I put a note of caution here on looking at these levels, but I do think it's a helpful management tool. Real quick, recognizing your, those three, that you're talking about on phase two, I understand why you would uh, would want to put in different categories. That is, we have different targets for how long it take to have an intensive needs person into housing versus somebody, you could be very quick with somebody with very minimal needs. But the, the middle column doesn't say time from case management to housing for these intensive needs people. It says number housed. Correct. And, and, and I have trouble then if that goes up, is that good, bad, or indifferent? But the time and having different targets for those time makes a lot of sense. Yes, and Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we sort of jumped into the second one, the days from case management to housing. For those that need that level of assistance, we want to make sure we want to make sure that everybody's accessing case management because even if you're homeless and are going to transition back out, there are things you can pick up from experienced case managers. <coughs> maybe it's some budgeting um, <coughs> budgeting skills, maybe it's referral to consumer credit counseling if you have medical bills hanging over your head. There are <coughs> things you will pick up, but it could be like a, a quick shot and then you're back out. We want to make sure that um, we have the right service <coughs> providers, and this is something that we have different providers in the community who are good at different parts of the continuum. So we want to make sure that referrals are getting to our, our providers in their wheelhouse. Um, so case management to housing, all of which will have that length of time and all of which is um, uh, part of this, this analysis that the coalition will be able to do. The coalition is the manager of the community's by name list. It's, that's actually a bit of a misnomer. It's, a, it's, a, it's an eligibility pool of people that we've assessed and we know the types of needs that they need. It can be for um, different types of services across the community, so it's not one list. It's, it's actually a, a more effective way of referring people to the right resources rather than the old way of doing business where that if the, the onus fell on the person to find the right program, get on their wait list, and maybe be out on six or seven different wait lists at any given time. So as we go out on the last one on our um, phase three, there are a couple of data points that are um, in HMIS, which are important ones, the returns to homelessness, how many people who we were serving prior um, and I think there's a two-year timeline on that. How many return back to homelessness? Um, and then the employment, the, the um, amount of um, hours, I think it's reported in hours. The employment is reported into the system so that we, we are encouraging people to um, move into full um, sustainability on their own as, as they go over time. 
many of these data points we're going to have to get together with our providers and um, it's the it's a it's a group that we haven't implemented yet but I, I call it the coordinated staying group <laughs> we have coordinated entry which is the coordination of all of our outreach services helping people get to housing and then we need coordinated staying um, so that we help them that's where things like our landlord liaison program um, looking at how we might divert someone from coming back into homelessness. Those that, those activities will be in that area, but we haven't really built that out yet in our system. Thank you, Ms. Brick. Mr. Whittleton has a question. Well, you know, I think the ultimate goal is to get people off on their own self-supporting and not a subsidized housing and so on. So Absolutely. that seems, is that muddled in phase three as some people are on vouchers still, still subsidized? I'd like to see this ultimate goal and you get the number of people who are off on their own, successful working, and that's really, those yeah. are the successes. Are they, are they, where are they? So actually tracking number of people who've transitioned off of the voucher is what is your, what you're suggesting? Just off on their own like normal people. Mm -hmm. That's the, to me, the goal. Yes, Tell me there's some. We have some, right? As, oh, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people do. <clears throat> Mr. Croft. Well, yeah, so is is, is that, I'm sure the eventual goal for a large portion of it, but aren't we going to have somewhere we're better off having them in stable housing, whether we subsidize or not, than on the street? If it, to the extent they have serious uh, mental of other disabilities, you you may be much better off having them independent, subsidized, and employed, but still subsidized maybe for a long, long period of time. It, so, how what percentage is is Mr. Weddleton's articulated goal to goal, and what is stable, subsidized, but independent and functioning the goal? If you're I have a couple things that, that I'm thinking about that. The, the answer is I don't know what percentages other communities have. I know we're not tracking it, so I don't, I couldn't say X percent. Um, I think we can do some research on that and see what percentage of people were expecting. Um, however, having spent a long time in housing and disability services at the state, there are a lot of people who are going to be on a voucher for a long time because being able to be employed at a competitive wage to afford rent in our community is is a, a big undertaking if a person has a disability. However, there are a lot of people with disabilities who felt overlooked because they weren't going to make it to that full-time competitive wage that they weren't provided opportunities to do something. Um, so we talk in the initiative definitely about volunteering or um, part-time work as very viable options so that you can, you know, be contributing whatever each person can. So that, that will be, I think, the frame that we will look at it. And there's a pretty cool um, tool that I think a lot of the service providers are using called the um, self-sufficiency mm -hmm. matrix that looks at different areas and, and it helps break down whether if you're, if transportation is your issue, you know, how you might address that issue as opposed to stamina to be at work all day or, you know, different areas. And so this tool allows people to kind of track progress over time um, towards self-sufficiency. All right, uh, before we move on to the, uh, to the next part, are there any questions from the committee on that data presentation? Okay, and any questions or comments from the audience regarding that data presentation? <coughs> okay, seeing none, we can go ahead and move on. Oh, sure, yes, go ahead. I would like to introduce the fabulous Henry Jackson to you, <laughs> um, who has helped us to develop a way of communicating some of the additional data that we spoke about in the subcommittee that's not included on our chart here. Um, the, other, the other pieces that uh, the municipality is focused on and the coalition and United Way are certainly joining us in this 
view, if you remember that box chart that we've reviewed, the community plan to end homelessness has three, three main focus areas. The first one is in program <coughs> and alignment of services to make sure that we're, we're um, collaborating and being effective together. The second one is really looking at your infrastructure, and this is where projects um, that I'm working on and the coalition and others are working on, um, such as uh, taking a look at rebuilding our Cliff Road Treatment Center so that people could get access to substance use, taking a look at our housing stock to make sure that um, we have adequate housing stock and the percentages of that housing that have um, support services attached to it, so monitoring that, um, that part of the community, making sure that we have an infrastructure in terms of data that, so that we can report outcomes to you. And then the third area in that chart that we've reviewed is around financial sustainability and looking at um, things like we were talking about at the beginning of the meeting, when a funding stream for mental health services changes, but it's been used for homeless outreach in the community, that we were making those decisions with the state in a collaborative way so that we understand the impacts of those changes on a pretty fragile homeless service system. So um, one way that communities are using um, GIS and mapping tools is to provide information on a website and I will say that this information that we're about to review is in development it was part of the subcommittee conversation and I think um, a very helpful part of it. But it's, it's not live yet, we're still taking edits, so I'm gonna be taking notes as we go through today to make sure that we, um, we get things right before we launch it, but I, I wanted to show this to the committee and to um, really thank Amber for the work that she's done to help us um, pull this together. So, um, do you wanna talk about that story that they can come? Sure, so um, this is a story map. It's a way to communicate with the public through text, graphics and maps and help people understand what they're looking at more. Maps can be super overwhelming if they don't have necessarily the explanation that you want next to it. So um, working with Nancy, this map shows where we are today with services and housing and then looks into some census data about Anchorage by block and kind of helps begin the story and the conversation around the data that Nancy's trying to present. So this is what this tool might look like on the website. We have the open data portal and there's the map gallery. Uh, I envision this sitting out on that um, resource. And um, it provides a way for us to um, have some uh, narrative so that you can you can explain maps in a little um, a little better way. So you can have narrative along the side talking about the collaboration. Um, planning across um, social boundaries, social services, looking at public safety needs, um, and then what you do is you go into the narrative here, you can go into maps that depict, um, this map for instance is a map that has um, the as we talked about in the committee, the, the committee would like to have a map that shows where um, the HUD funded units are in the community, which includes public housing units. And um, this map also has the supported housing units that were provided to the committee in this summary report that looks like this. And what this is, is um, one of the questions that we've been reviewing is where is the housing going into neighborhoods um, where are people um, having the opportunity to be housed when they're transitioning out of homelessness and to receive the appropriate social services in the community? So the top units, um, the circles, are the places where um, HUD housing is located, and that would be general um, affordable housing. And then the squares are the places where um, supported housing units are located. And so we. And uh, Mr. Weddleton has a question. Sure. So like that uh, gold color, that's just a general area that you're highlighting the neighborhood and that has um, like 10 supported housing units in that area or something? 
The coloration that's um, over here is marking for the circles a, um, this unit right here would be fewer than 10 HUD housing um, in that location. In a particular building? Yeah, in a building. And, but what about the gold squares that are the supported housing? That's why that looks like it highlights a neighborhood. So those are parcel boundaries, and that's pulled from 2015 planning data on where multifamily parcel housing is now. So it's a current stock of the multifamily parcels within the community, not necessarily symbolizing that there are currently supported housing units there. So on that gold under supporting housing, oh, there may not, you're just saying that's a multifamily housing area. Because we can't track where people with vouchers go, so they could be at any of the multifamily parcels in the city. So Why can't just, you track it? It's not uh, reported when a person goes to live. Thank you, Mr. Bettleton. Mr. Traney has a question. Could you send a copy of this to clerk's office so we can make your submission to assembly members? It's a little hard to see from here for mm -hmm. sure. my colleagues on the other side of the table. Sure. You just send it to clerk, we'll make your submission. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a great idea to let the assembly members go in and kind of look around and, and um, take a look at this data. Um, so the the if you look at our summary report, one of the things that's coming, this, this summary report is coming out of our homeless management information system data. What, you're, what we're seeing is that roughly 80% of the people who come through our homeless service system are getting receiving assistance in the form of a voucher or um, case management services, and they're moving into scattered locations across the community. 20% of the folks, 20, sorry, 28% of the folks are um, moving into sites that are single site housing that um, are represented in one building. So that is a percentage that we do want to monitor as a community because we, we think back to the levels of need that we saw. Um, we think that the high needs population who would be more likely to live in a single site location it's going to be between 20 and 30 percent. So if our numbers are correct on the level of need, then our, our resources appear to be matching it. Um, this is the first time we've ever looked at how that data correlates, so I say appear to be matching it because we, we need to do some more analysis with it. So we can then uh, move through the next area that we can look at is where the services are. One of the distinctions that we want to be helping the community make is that um, services, when a, person is, uh, when a person is not housed, they're more likely to be interacting with the community. They're more likely to try to be, get their, um, have their needs met in a public space. And the impacts on neighborhoods are, um, are greater. And so planning, if we look at the planning in this map, this is, these are the locations where emergency um, services are located. Um, and actually in this, when you, when you get this map and you take a look at it, we've also included um, the CCRC units. So this purple unit up here at the top is the Cordova Center. Um, it's the, the, the title of what this will be is Emergency or Temporary Services. So that we can start just looking as a community where these services are located, and um, this this map also shows the bus routes mapped across it, so that we can um, do some more planning as a community around these resources. Mr. Traney, ma'am, so you've already put the Cordova Center there on the map. Yes. The purple one. Yes. You know the assembly's not approved yet. I'm sorry. No, it's not. No, it's a different one. Okay. But it was yeah. just the corrections okay. facility, the halfway house, right? I thought it was maybe the one Chris was worried about. No, it's part yeah. of it. Okay, thank you. And these are just buildings. These are just um, tracking of buildings or beds for um, shelter use. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
This is a this is a heat map or this is a density map of where camps are reported. We're now able to recognize where we've had a, a frequency of camp reports, and so this map is um, shows us where camp locations are most frequently reported. The next thing we talked about is we, we want to have a focus on um, employment. We also want to understand um, this is broken out by census track the, um, from the last uh, census report about employment and income in, in different areas of the community. And the graph is, oh, it's right there. Red and orange are the highest unemployment and blue is the lowest in the community. And then this chart at the bottom here shows, um, talks about the um, most frequent um, report of homelessness and employment or lack of income is reported as the, the highest reason that people um, enter homelessness. It was pointed out in the, the data committee, at the subcommittee meeting, I think it was a good point that um, employment might be indicated as the cause, but what cause the disruption employment is not um, recorded in this, so we don't know if it was a medical problem or if it's a substance use issue or a mental health issue. Um, it could just be recorded as employment, so that could be over um, overestimated there. Um, then we can look at income for the community, where the income distribution is according to census data, um, and then looking at poverty, looking at apartment rentals. I'm just going to um, switch through this um, so that we can start tracking um, where there are options for apartment rentals in, in, in different parts of the community. And then we look at home ownership. So you get the idea that what this map will allow us to do is to present a large amount of data to the community in one summary so that we have a, um, a fuller picture of homelessness and causes um, than maybe just zeroing in on um, some of the things that we focused on in the past. And then last, on a public <coughs> tool like this, um, we want to make sure that we provide additional information. So this is a this is the first draft of a tool. We think this will be a useful tool. We're going to have it um, in draft and uh, reviewed quite a bit before we make it public for the, the community. We want to make sure that we're portraying things that they will find useful, and um, we will get it to the clerk so that it can be distributed to the members. Thank you, Mr. Train. How often will you update this? Yearly or semi-annually or what? The census data. So census data, this is from the 2015 ACS census data. They released 2016. It should be on September 1st. So census data is released yearly by law. So at that point, we will update it then. As far as the parcels go, those are from 2015 from planning. These are live services. So as the underlying data changes, it will reflect on that. Would you just, if you could, put on there the data it's affected by? Yeah. So when people are looking at it, they know what time and point this data comes from. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Mr. Lampkin. So I know this is the first draft on the, uh, say, say the housing page. Are you going to uh, put the data on, uh, say, a, a point and click on those squares and circles so we know what agency it is and the location of the agency? Thank you, Mr. Lampkin. Um, any other questions uh, from the committee? Okay, seeing none, any questions or comments from the audience? I'll just say, as a yeah. visual learner, that is so helpful. So whoever was put all the time in it, it was you, Ms. Amber, thank you, because that's an incredible amount of work. <coughs> and I just think that's going to help a lot of people who sometimes get lost in graphs, but that's just really helpful, so thank you. And can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm again? sorry, Elizabeth Schultz. Thank you. Visual yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zach, we're just the, um, the bus maps. Those are the ones that are going to come out in October or current? 
So the routes on there right now are the current routes okay. because we're looking at housing as it is today. We're working right now with transit to release maps of the October, the new routes that are coming out in October, and at that point we'll transition to the routes. Okay, seeing no other comments or questions, um, thank you. Um, that's definitely evolved a lot since uh, we saw it, so really thank you for your hard work on that. Um, so we'll move on to the Parkview uh, project update. The, um, the Parkview project update is that meeting uh, last week with the, uh, the company, and just so by way of summary, this, um, the facility is located at 831 um, B Street and is um, presently um, in use by the, the GEO group, but not housing um, people at this time. And so the, uh, the concept is as we look at the number of people who are in the shelter and we assess their needs as we're going through assessments of each person, Catholic Social Services has identified that there is a significant number of people over the age of 65 who we feel could be have their needs better met by social services in the senior service area as well as senior um, housing across the community. Um, so that represents uh, Order of the population um, with a building that's sitting vacant the concept is to lease the building for a minimum of two years to bring that population of elders into a, a shelter situation where they we can do a deeper assessment we can one of the primary things we want to learn is how did they get to homelessness what part of our safety net for elders is um, not serving them well and how can we work with the state, partner with the state to address it. Um, so conducting more assessments of the, of the elders, working with them to determine um, you know, the best location for them to live. We think that some people may be um, stranded in Anchorage and want to return to other communities um, to be with family or to, um, to live in, their, in a home community. So um, accessing a vacant building to work with these elders, stabilize them, and we, we've heard from housing providers in the community that a pipeline for referrals of people who are ready for senior housing units would be most welcome, and we could probably find a way to sync up that pipeline if we better understood some of the causes that are bringing people to homelessness and how we can help stabilize them more quickly. So um, working with Catholic Social Services and housing <coughs> providers, that would be step one of having those elders in, make sure that we can bring appropriate social services to them and moving to housing or home community. Um, so the building uh, is, we don't have an update on the, the lease negotiation yet. Robin Ward is handling that. I checked with her yesterday. There was no update on um, our letter of intent to lease to the GEO group, they're considering it, and um, we will hopefully hear back from them very shortly. Okay, thank you. Mr. Trainee. So they haven't figured out what the cost is going to be for two years late, two year late shift? Right. Okay. Because, like I said, as we try to go into this year's budget, we need to know ahead of time what the two year cost is going to be, and I want to know how long beyond two years, because sometimes we'll see. A project comes through a two year <coughs> lease, but with three more uh, follow up leases on it. So, we'll know what the cost factor is. Thank you. At this, I, I can give a little update on that. The, um, the Geo Group is not interested in um, a longer term lease, um, although we do need to, if we get other funding, for instance, if there's grant funding in the project, two years really is a minimum timeline for um, philanthropy to consider a project. So, we, we do need to make sure that everyone's comfortable with the length of time, but this facility is a um, CCRC. They intend to maintain that operation. Um, this is not a change of um, building status for that project. There's a bus stop by the building. So the seniors, if they're gonna be there, many of them don't have a car. Yes. So we can get the bus system there to pick them up. Is they're gonna make sure we get a bus stop there? Yes, I need to look at that. I haven't looked at well, that. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Mr. Lampkin. How many units? 46, I think. 46. Okay. 
any other questions uh, from the committee? Seeing none, any questions or comments from the audience? Okay, thank you. So we'll go ahead and uh, move on to Fire Station 1. Um, so if we could have uh, paramedic uh, Mike Riley and Assistant Chief Alex Boyd come to the table, please. Um, so, uh, um, thank you to, uh, for attending this committee meeting. Uh, Mr. Constant, uh, wanted to get an update from Fire Station 1, um, and he apologizes he couldn't be here today. He is in Barcelona enjoying himself. Um, yeah, poor guy. Um, so Mr. Constant really wanted to invite you so we could get, um, sort of a reality from the boots on the ground, and as he said see if there were any alternative intervention ideas that you wanted to bring forward. Uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the, to the board of the committee and, and uh, thank you for the time. Uh, unfortunately, in, in the request, we, we weren't very focused in our data, so we have some very general numbers to peek at. Station 1 and its numbers. And uh, uh, Firefighter Paramedic Riley is here to uh, sort of speak uh, as the authority that boots on the ground that can speak to some of those numbers there. Um, and we've been sort of uh, refining the data uh, as we speak, so uh, we'll be jumping back and forth on here. So we'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, uh, paramedic at Station 3 in Mountain View, Mike Riley. Uh, I have just quick background, I've taken an interest in high utilizers, so that's kind of how I wound up here at the boots and the ground level um, high utilizers and how to uh, prevent it or, or uh, curb it, or how are we going to assist it. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, but what comes from that is that we. Uh, clearly have the, most of our high utilizers coming from this area and most specifically the campus of uh, Beans and Brother Francis being our, our hottest spot, although it's kind of a hot spot. Um, so with that being said, to Station 1, uh, we can't just say that uh, just Station 1 is affected by that. Um, just a quick background on that, we are a uh, area-wide EMS response, so if a unit in Station 1's area is not available, it pulls from outside of that area. So it pulls from Mountain View and Spinard. So uh, we can't just speak. I can give you numbers on Station 1, and they are very impressive, but uh, it, it is actually a bigger issue than that. Um, so currently in the 27, our 2017 uh, time frame, uh, we are at about 6,000 responses out of Station 1. Um, and that is between uh, two engines, uh, one ALS medic rig and two BLS medic rigs. Um, and that's important, that last part being the BLS. We now have three ambulances. Uh, only one has paramedic staff, two are our EMT staff, so they're taking that lower acuity call. So to break that down a little bit further, uh, medic one is running about 2,400 ALS calls. Doesn't mean they all are, they'll run both ALS and BLS. But medic 81 and 82, are uh, made up between them about 3,200 additional calls uh, between those two rigs. So they're about 1,600 calls each to date. Um, this is gonna blow last year's numbers out of the water. Uh, last year, 2016, uh, Medic One ran a total of 3,800, and this date is a little bit skewed because 8182 went in service in May. So we had five months they were running without the three ambulances downtown. It was May that we started running those three ambulances. And then 8182 had 1,500 and 1,600 collectively through 10 months, nine months of data. So they're already surpassing last year's, and we're not even into the fourth quarter yet. Uh, just responses are just up this year. Um, this is the total for the downtown. Oh, so I was I quoted you wrong. 8,100 calls last year out of Station One. So and we're at about 7,000. So we're we're going to far surpass last year's numbers. Um, like I said, the campus is kind of a hot spot. Uh, so we got numbers by grid. So that means it's not just, I, we can look it up by uh, address as well, but we can also do by grid, which is a better representation of kind of what's going on in, the, in that hot spot. So it's saying not just the responses from those two addresses, but it's responses from third and fourth car and Carla. Carla is kind of that through between, we get a large number of instances there. A lot of our larger uh, spice calls um, with multiple patients happens there. Uh, so with that grid, uh, 1232, uh, 
uh, we've had to date uh, 2,300 calls just to that area. Um, that's more than the rest of the city. I mean, several fire stations combined in the rest of the city. We're running, we're running into that one area in the city. Um, so it's really, it's really beating us up pretty heavily down there, I guess for lack of a better word. Um, anything like that? Uh, I believe that uh, sort of this, uh, the numbers, the very specific numbers for fire station one speak to really the global issue of, of homelessness and its effects on the Anchorage fire service area and EMS care as a whole. Uh, to put it in perspective, last year we had 38,000 calls for service and as we speak to six and 7,000 calls to a single grid area, um, that's significant. And it's not that we're, that we're sort of picking on that one specific grid or that area. It's just that that's where we concentrate a lot of the services in the area and tends to be the population in that in that district that calls for our services on a regular basis. Um, so again, it is not intended to uh, say that that grid or that service area is a high utilizer, but it does point to the service per, the service users in that area um, to fall within this, this group for us. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot filter out other areas of town. We have the, the GIS data that's, uh, that's becoming available to us to be able to filter more and more and actually isolate this data as we, as we need to and we know that there's a desire to track this on a more focused uh, effort. That'll give us uh, opportunity in the future. So we appreciate you having us here. We appreciate any questions to help us guide on what we're looking for in the future and any future meetings they might be looking into on this as well. Thank you. Mr. Traney. First, thanks for your service. How is this affecting your budget? Because to go to 8,000, what you had last year, that's got to really drain your budget. Uh, so what are you looking at? Because we're setting in the budget season. Absolutely. One of the, uh, the biggest challenges we're facing with the budget is uh, we obviously ask for uh, voters to approve an additional two ambulances. Uh, it is affecting us in the sense that we have to continue to provide the ambulance transport services within the city uh, to provide the services being requested in the city. Uh, and if we can't see an increase in our budget, we will have to offset those costs of additional ambulances, Medic 81, Medic 82, which despite the, the um, lack of approval, uh, on the bond, we've been able the to- The demand approve. doesn't go away. Right, right, the, the demand does not disappear. We are there in the end. So those costs shift out of other areas of our service. Uh, very, very fortunate that the union has stepped up for us and, and given us the opportunity to staff under the safe levels for uh, fire staffing our apparatus, and when I say safe levels, this is a nationally recommended level, but they're willing to accept a, a little bit of pain now to help serve the city. However, that side letter disappears on January 1st. If we don't see a funding increase as we go into January 1st, we start to have to weigh the demands of the city's transport needs with the demands of fire service within the, within the city. If we don't see some sort of an increase because our budget cannot go down, we have to see service go away after that budget goes down. You know, the administration has asked for a 5% reduction in the first responders, which you guys. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Ms. Tomboski. Uh, thanks. Alex, when you're talking about under the safe levels, you're talking about the four packs that being okay. gave up. So, out of the entire city, I just want to make sure we're clear. Out of the entire city, how many engine companies do we run? We run currently 13 engine companies. And how many of those do we run with four packs? We are currently running five or four packs right now. Uh, the contract calls for eight. The con so effectively, uh, we've always run under the uh, the NAPA standards. Yes, the NAPA standards seventeen ten requiring or recommending four person staffing on all apparatus. We have run under that previously, and the offset number comes with the co location of multiple apparatus on a single station. Okay. Um, I want to get back to the, uh, what is the annual cost for uh, Medics 81 and 82? Uh, approximately 2.3 uh, million on operating budget will increase. Okay, and let me just ask you a different question because this is one I think others aren't really focused in on. Um, with a high level of, of calls down in that um, grid, that hot spot kind of area, um, I'm under the understanding that uh, there have been numerous conflicts, and in fact, that now we're dispatching an engine company to go down to protect, basically protect the first responders that are going down there. Is that accurate? That is correct. So, can you explain for the committee members who maybe haven't heard about this uh, directive what's going on? And in fact, when the it's not just, um, I think uh, Mike did a really good job 
of explaining the response, but it's not really just ambulances going. When there's an accident or when there's a call down there, it's so dangerous for the first responders, they're actually sending back up to protect the first responders to do their job. Correct. The, the combination in a lot of our run numbers is that we work with CAP team and other meetings throughout, and working with the staff, uh, looking for solutions. However, the population in that area, the interactions become more and more violent. As a result of that, we've had uh, physical damage to the apparatus. Uh, there have not been any injuries to employees, however. They've been involved in incidents where they have to rapidly withdraw, wait for police to come in and, and take care of the situation. Uh, our ambulance is run with two personnel on the ambulance at all times to affect medical care in the event that we need lifting assistance or further uh, assistance and personnel assistance. We will bring in another fire apparatus. Uh, and everyone is trained across staff. Michael Ride today, he's on engine three. Uh, today and we'll ride on medic three or four days and, and so they'll float in and out everyone has the same training when we call in that engine company that engine company is not available for fire suppression response we really are augmenting a lot of our ems care with our fire response uh, and, uh, and essentially that challenge is occurring so when we have incidents occurring throughout the city sending crews to provide backup watch your back ensure the equipment's not being stolen off the apparatus damage is not being done to the apparatus uh, and that our personnel are being attacked because they're just outnumbered by the folks that we're trying to care for. Um, that that provides a significant strain on us. We're routinely sending supervisory resources as well as engine companies, truck companies, um, to these responses, and not just at means Brother Francis, but all the responses that we're ending up with where we find these hostile scenarios. But the APD is very, very challenged with their resource pool as well. Uh, when we call for them, we may not be able to respond into an incident for an extended amount of time because we're waiting for police protection um, just to protect our responders. So, so it is providing significant strain across the board. Brother Francis, uh, with the high number of those events, uh, is we've placed in policy that they will not respond any emails alone to that to that district, to that location any longer. Unfortunately, the situation is a great Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bosky. Mr. Lampkin. So would it be safe to say, since it puts a strain or a drain on your facility, like this APD, would it not also put a further strain or have you heard from uh, the medical facilities like Providence? Absolutely. There was, there was a discussion this morning in the medical advisory board about this, this subject that uh, with increased uh, needs of the community leveraging on the, the emergency rooms, the emergency care facilities, other options are being examined on how to provide care to a population that is otherwise not served. Uh, so that strain on all services and all support services in the area. Um, we may see sort of the canary in the coal mine effect with police and fire, but we will see that dramatically affected elsewhere. Uh, and, and I'm very, very appreciative to this board and this committee and the groups both that are working on this because this will affect us in the future more and more. So obviously if we can correct it to some degree, it will lessen the pressure across the board. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Lampkin. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask a brief follow-up to Mr. Bossy's question. You said that the policy now is that the medics won't go alone. I'm wondering how you define alone. Is it Has she characterized it where you always go with an engine, or could you go with <coughs> a police car, for example? Does that count as not alone? Or they, they it has to be. Always respond to the fire apparatus. Now. Okay. Uh, historically, in, in any challenging situation, we've requested police assistance to help monitor and watch, and, and they've been great about responding. When they know we've got a call down there, they'll break free and come with us. But now we've had so many events that we just, in an effort to provide an increase in numbers and uniform staff, we have a couple of police officers and fire truck on everything we do in that area. And it, it's becoming more common for us to request that in other locations throughout the city as well, where we're interfacing with pockets. Of so you, you ask for a police, you ask for police assistance every time you respond out there? Yeah. Um, okay. And if I may just clarify a little bit. Uh, might clear it up a little bit. So a single resource response is figured out at uh, dispatch. So dispatch gets the call, they triage the complaint, and they decide this is a high acuity, low acuity call, and is a single resource response effective. So we do get calls uh, at a certain area that are not non-emergent. I guess is a great word. Uh, somebody's foot is sore. Uh, you know, I need them to look at this. I want an assessment. Something like that. Those are all single resource responses, and that happens all over the city. 
uh, all we're saying now is that no longer will that be a single resource response. No matter what the complaint, it will always have an end with it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dombowski? It may be helpful for the committee members who are trying to understand how much um, how much fire resources are really going in by looking at the directive. Can you provide the directive, uh, the, the department directive for this response? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Dombowski. Mr. Weddleton. You know, I guess, so you're, it sounds like you, there's so many people down there that you're outnumbered and some of them are violent. So there's been suggestions that we should dilute the population and have more than one in cafe and Brother Francis <coughs> elsewhere. Would that be helpful? Um, honestly, it would just be speculation. Um, I fear that by splitting the locations, it's not going would adequately manage that site and that location and those elements would now just be split between the two sources um, where uh, it may be valuable for uh, that split but again I'm not sure um, quick answer for me is if we can handle with 10 people let's put 10 people in one spot rather than have to break it up potentially send 20 people throughout the city to handle two different locations All right, thanks. okay any other questions from the committee Seeing none, any questions or comments from the audience specific to this topic? Um, yes. Thanks very much for the information. I'm curious, how, um, how do you decide on how many uh, pieces of equipment to send out to a vehicular accident somewhere in the city? How are those decisions made? The as the initial callers come in, the, our dispatchers uh, will collect information and determine number of patients, severity of incident, potential resources, and uh, throughout the city we have taken those resources and allocated specific equipment. So, for example, a, a vehicle accident that will require um, rescue tools to pry open the cars for the jaws of life. Uh, we have those only on specific apparatus throughout the city, uh, strategically placed so that they have a short response time. Uh, also, the very complex accidents where we will require to cut open cars, potentially lift cars off of other ones. Uh, we have one vehicle in town, which is our, our heavy rescue unit that, can, that is capable of responding to that. So, as we gain more information about what's happening on the scene, we will allocate more resources as the needs increase. Our goal is to put the most efficient response out of the street as fast as possible, which would be a single resource. Get them there quickly, get the closest unit to the scene, provide them <coughs> and move. In the event that they find something where they don't add resources in the end. And again, this sort of speaks back to Mr. Bosky's question about well, why we're sending so many. We have so many occurrences in that, and with a lot of the population we're serving, that we've just started adding that extra resources, you knowing that it's a high level. So, um, for it calls uh, for other reasons around the city, um, how often do you send double apparatus? It is uh, a very fair question, and it is a very common practice. For the 38,000 calls, in, in approximately 38,000 calls we had in uh, 2016, 78,000 dispatches occurred, so that means 78,000 apparatus left the fire stations. Uh, and that could be... Uh, so it's almost two to every one. Yeah. They, they, they some, yeah, some of them will take a single resource, and others, like our structure fires, will see 11 resources there's a sort of this sliding scale. The high resource allocation uh, above two resources is much less frequent than the single resource uh, response and double resource response. Uh, I don't have those numbers. So, and, and actually, I, I apologize. For purposes of time, we do have to move on. Uh, Mr. Oliva, then Mr. Weddleton. My name is Ronald Oliva. I've got a couple handouts here. But I want to thank these guys because I had a heavy industrial accident. I'm next to the shelter. So if they get 8,000 calls, how many do you think I get? And this fracture broke my hip, my pelvis, my hip knuckle bone here, and spiral broke my femur and twisted it into my thigh. Quite painful. Station one, if I would have stroked out, it's three minutes. I have a 70% chance of survival. 
Station 3 Airport Heights, if they're not available due to the Mandong law in the state of Alaska, 10 minutes, 30% chance of survival. As I laid there and my workers had a, the dispatcher on the speaker phone, where do you think those ambulances were at? Ever so close to me, but they were at the shelter. So I laid there in pain, refused the fentanyl because we have an opiate addiction, and just thought of my uncle who ran a veterans hospital, 2,600 bed, 1,500 bed psychiatric, that those veterans really suffered. So this little break, I can suffer. And I waited. But then he said, we got to get you in the ambulance. We'll give you enough to get you in there. You'll feel a floating sensation. So to get me in the ambulance, I stopped talking, took the dose, and then I couldn't talk anymore. He said, are you all right? I said, no, we can float in the back of this ambulance. And then I got the surgery, which was difficult. I want to thank these guys because every time they go down, they risk their lives. And those two last murders, one of the murderers came on to my lot and then put me at risk, put my customers at risk, my employees at risk. That's why I surrendered and going to leave. But if you want to solve this problem, you close that shelter and you close beans. That's a $2 million budget. If I had five calls to the policeman, you'd find me $500. They're exempt. They got enough money to pay the fines and offset the cost of these ambulances. And when I called the police, triage, report it, report it. That's all you have to do is report it. No cop. Dick, you said it a lot of times you wait an hour, two hours, and whatnot. So, Mr. Oliva, if you can wrap it up, time, please. Every time, Felix, they get a call, boom. They're down there would assist. It's totally unnecessary. We've gone beyond any decency in helping these people. They don't deserve it. And the girl who fell out of Cordova condominiums, eight years old, she fell out of the second story. She had to wait for an ambulance. So all of you who have children, who do you want to help? That junkie, that drunk, that returning person who doesn't accept the fact that they got a problem and get the true services they need, let them die. Don't assess them, assist them in a protracted suicide. I'm done. I'm moving out. My property's for sale. But you're not going to spread these vermin across the city. That's not going to happen. You're not going to let them in your backyard. And I say don't do it because it's a high risk, it's dangerous, and even the best that we have are scared to go down there, rightly so, to provide service to them. Don't give it to them. Right. Thank you, Mr. Oliva. Your time is up, months, Mr. Oliva. Those two places are going to be closed. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. i got to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> Stand up. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Um, so the okay. safety patrol calls used to go to them. Now they're routed through the fire department's dispatcher. Is it? And there, we've seen their calls going down, and yours going up. Is it that maybe the dispatchers are deciding things that maybe used to go to safety patrol now are going to you? Uh, I can't speak specifically where we're going, but anecdotally, in, in a discussion with our dispatch center, and they, I think the adjustments made at the, uh, at the service patrol have helped us better serve that population, uh, and the, the interventions that were put in place there have reduced the number for them, not increased our number. So I think our number would have gone up. Not believe that we're seeing more calls as a result of their changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what, would, what are you doing that makes their calls go down? Uh, they, they've had some internal changes on uh, patients that they can manage and the number of times that they can uh, have them or how long they can have them before they're referred to other agencies, uh, whether it be police or emergency room uh, elements to intervene. Um, so. What are those? So that once they pick someone up three times, they won't go back to get them again? Or something. Is that what you're saying? It, it's more the uh, the required interventions that occur in the NCC in the crowd that are yeah. intervening at that level um, are assisting in reducing the number of urgent calls that they're getting. Um, so their impact is showing in a reduced number of ASP and not an increased number uh, in the fire department. It is, is my opinion based on what we're seeing. All right. Thanks.
Thank you. Mr. George. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, so far in the meeting, we've heard that we have additional need for police resources to be used for account, which in all likelihood is being able to account. And we don't know how much that's going to cost, but that will cost something. We've also heard that there'll be a loss of half a million dollars of funding um, in addition to a potentially 5% reduction to AMP. Um, about five or six years ago, I was working with the Andrew Chanchow Partnership in the University, looked into the cost per call for AFD and APD um, ambulance versus fire apparatus uh, to justify having anchor safety control go 24 hours. Uh, previously, it didn't go 24 hours a day, and so those calls and transports were being picked up by fire apparatus or ambulance or whoever police. And we actually showed it was more cost effective to have those hands on the road. Uh, but now we're hearing that we're having a minimum of two units, potentially three units, respond to every call. And so my question is, um, about five or six years ago, we actually got a dollar value per call uh, per type of apparatus that was sent out, provided by the city. Is that something that we know today, roughly a call per ambulance per fire truck, um, so that we can know how much these calls are, are costing us and what the potential cost is saving by reducing five or 10 or 20% of these calls by a cheap within our current budget. We, we can't produce those numbers in the for you today. There are no accounts yet. I know currently it's changes in uh, uh, ambulance staffing equipment, uh, personnel costs that have changed since the previous number. They will be close, but not exactly what we used previously. Would you know perhaps what the rough cost per call to this high intensity grid would be? I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable speculating. We just not having those numbers. Um, uh, however, uh, it will be close to what we used previously. <coughs> so, if I recall those numbers correctly, it was in the neighborhood of five hundred to six hundred dollars per fire truck, uh, two to three hundred dollars per ambulance, and about one hundred and fifty to two hundred per police vehicle. And so, those, those are dollars per call. those are based off direct cost of readiness, uh, and that does not include any material use on our response. So that that's why. So six to seven thousand calls so far this year, and ten thousand dollars a call. Potential. Thank you, Mr. George. Um, so uh, we do have to uh, wrap up this meeting, but I do want to give, since uh, Ms. Souter had her hand up, if you want to speak. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, you know, and when you're trying to look at the cost per call, you know. I would assume that a lot of the costs are already wrapped into your annual budget, correct? Because you're staffed for X number of people per station, per apparatus in your budget. I understand the cost per call will change depending on the um, supplies that are used and how much the fire company can recover from insurance, from you know whatever services. But per se, more calls doesn't necessarily, I mean, I'm sure it absolutely puts more strain on the department, it puts more strain on the community, it puts more strain on everybody, but it doesn't necessarily have a direct correlation to increase costs. Exactly, does it? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>